Hi, and welcome everyone to the United Nations Rome-based agency's masterclass on blockchain. My name is Gladys Morales. I am Senior Innovation Advisor at the Change Delivery and Innovation Unit at the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Before we start, I would like to ask you to please turn off your video and camera unless you're a panelist at today's event. This is a reminder that today's session is being recorded and that by joining the session, you are agreeing to the recording taking place and to our agencies uh, sharing this video with uh, their audiences. Frontier technologies have an enormous potential to foster growth and accelerate the achievement of the sustainable development goals. I am pleased to welcome you today as FAO, IFAD and WFP share their experiences, progress and lessons learned in the development of blockchain solutions. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Eric Van Ingen, Digital Agriculture and Innovation Specialist at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you, Glendis Morales. On behalf of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and our two sister agencies, the International Fund for Agriculture Development and the World Food Program, I would like to welcome you to the World Food Forum Blockchain Masterclass 101. The World Food Forum is a youth-led movement and a network to transform our food systems to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals SDGs, in particular Goal 2 Zero Hunger. I want to thank the, w, the World Food Forum team and Agustino Grossi for their help in making this moment possible. FAO, EFAT and WFP are UN agencies that have their headquarters in Rome and we are working on food security, agriculture and nutrition. Food security is crucial and we need to make sure that no one is left behind. We as the three agencies, FAO, IFAD and World Food Programme, are looking for new technologies to understand their potential to overcome development ch challenges. Today we talk blockchain. The momentum around blockchain has tremendously increased this year and also last year as many, many of us got to know new concepts like central bank digital currencies and non-fungible tokens. We have set our blockchain priority on generating value for sustainability in the agri-food value chain. A lot of this starts with using blockchain for traceability. Blockchain can only work well in a wider ecosystem where we use artificial intelligence, big data, internet of things, APIs, and the so-called digital twins. I would like to re-emphasize that this is true of all digital solutions and blockchain is not an exception to this rule. Digital solutions always need an ecosystem to become truly sustainable. The ecosystem consists of policies, regulations, framework, infrastructure, data, data governance, and above all, improved human capital to use and extract benefit from digital technologies. We need to design and implement blockchain for agriculture, where it brings benefit to our stakeholders. We should not introduce newer divides in society like the digital divide. We need to design the digital notion of sustainability in the agri-food value chain with a user-centric and demand-driven approach. The UN Rome-based agencies work on bringing sustainability in our interventions by working on cross-cutting topics such as child labor, living income, gender equality and capacity development. We can do this through an innovation process with behavioral science, design thinking and agile methodologies. With the UN Rome-based agencies, we have generated great collaborative energy around blockchain. And that's the only reason why all the three of us together could organize this session for you today. We're excited about the unique potential of blockchain to improve the agri-food value chain out of this collective strategic thinking. And we join forces for today's math class. You will now leave the plenary session and be assigned randomly to a first cycle of a breakout room of either FAO, EFAT or WFP with their thematic presentations. In the file room, we have Max Runzel, CEO from Hivesex, Gerard Sylvester, FAO investment officer that will present the digital ledger technology for agriculture. And they walk you through the promising use case of hybrid smart contracts in agriculture. In the EFAT room, we have Brenda Gunde, Global ICT for the Senior Technical Specialist from the Sustainable Production Markets and Inst Institutions Division and Maria Fernanda Miranda Munoz, Policy Specialist. Trace Blockchain will talk about blockchain applications 
to development finance, enhancing transparency, growth, and social inclusion. And they will do a demo of Trace, which is a blockchain tool developed by EFAT to trace funds from donors to small scale farmers. Finally, in the WFP room, we have Kyriakos Kouparis. He is head of frontier innovations from the Innovation Accelerator. He will focus on blockchain applications for financial inclusions, logistics, and the supply chain. You will have the opportunity to exchange closely with them through a question and answer session. After 50 minutes, we all come back here and we have the plenary session where we will share the lessons learned with the moderation of Gladys Morales, which is the senior innovation advisor from EFAT Change Delivery and Innovation Unit. Then you will have the opportunity to choose again your second breakout room and continue the cycle of good discussions with the expert. And after 50 minutes, we come back again to again a lessons learned session. Jean Martin Bauer, senior advisor from WFP, will close the masterclass at the end. I wish you all a very inspiring masterclass, and you will now soon go to your breakout room. Thank you. Great. I open the rooms now, and please choose the room that you want to join. Let's begin. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you are having a wonderful start to the week. Max and I are very happy to be here to share some of our experiences on the use of distributed ledger systems and how it could be used to solve some of the development challenges that we face. So moving on, in this context, in the context of this presentation, we will look at three use cases. As we all know, smallholder agriculture faces several challenges, challenges that are a huge hindrance to achieving several of the SDG goals. Can emerging and established technologies help offset some of these challenges? That's the question. Blockchain is one such emerging technologies that has the potential so in the context of this presentation, we'll try to address three areas where we feel that blockchains could make an impact. The first is on agriculture insurance. How can we make agricultural insurance better? How can we make the process and the time required to verify and make claims faster? Can we get a combination of satellites, drone-based data, and the use of mobile wallets and smart contracts with certified oracles to help uh, improve the uptake and uh, impact of uh, smallholder agri insurance. The next is on incentivizing climate smart, good agriculture practices. Can we use technology to incentivize smallholder producers and others in the value chain to produce, distribute, and consume responsibility? Finally, on food traceability, giving smallholders an opportunity to participate in high value markets strengthening market linkages and thereby improving livelihoods and contributing more efficiently to food security of the country and the world at large. To get into some of these details, I hand it over to Max. Thanks a lot, Gerard. I'm very pleased to be here. Yeah, my name is Max and I'm eager to hear all of your questions. Um, before we get started here, I'm just gonna cover um, a little bit of the, the basis, so to say. I try to be as high level as I can. I'm looking forward to any type of questions or if you wanna get into more technical detail. Let's start off by smart contracts. And smart contracts, I think we're all familiar with those. It's simple if-when statements. If something occurs, then something else happens. There are two main benefits that we have with these types of smart contracts. First off, they're pre-coded. So the moment something happens, they can be automatically executed. And that, of course, is a huge benefit to farmers. So what exactly could that look like? What if in a growing phase of my crop, for example, I had too low temperatures on just one day? or too high temperatures on just one day? Or what if during my application period, I had too much rain and the input distribution didn't work out? Those precise moments can be measured and execute particular payments that then are settled immediately, which gives benefits to the farmers. As we know that managing cash flow is one of the key issues that farmers face throughout the cycle. So anything that can be accelerated there has tremendous potential. But let's look at one other case where smart contracts really can make a difference. So this is more for the adaptation and compensation vis-a-vis -vis more adverse effects, right? Something goes wrong, something is more direct, more adverse in a climatic event, and you immediately help the farmers um, by leveraging and working on the, on the effects it has on their cash situation. 
But if we go one step further, we know, yes, we have to adapt to climate change. We have to make sure that these adverse events are covered. We also have to ensure that we go one step further and that we start to nudge and incentivize good agricultural practices. And here is where a whole world of new application opportunities happens. And this is what we were hearing earlier in this Gerard said, of course, there's this more classical case where you take remote sensing data, for example. But what happens if you go one step further and you look into child nutrition, particular SDGs, learning outcomes in schools. So what are potential events that can be datafied and that then are translated from the real world into the blockchain and out into the real world again? To do so and to have smart contracts that actually function, we need something, as Eric said earlier today, which is almost like a digital twin. These digital twins are so-called oracles. So whenever there is something that happens in the real world, there is an or uh, oracle that digitizes this component. However, with Oracle, there are a couple of with oracles, there's a couple of problems that we have. How do we ensure that the right data is there when we need a certain contract to be executed? So let's look a little bit deeper into like one, what type of data points could we be collecting on child nutrition, for example, or even just on cooking stoves? And how can oracles in particular and decentralized Oracle networks help with that use case. And that's what I'll be explaining here in a second. So really, DAWNs, decentralized Oracle networks, are systems that function as an intermediate layer to get anything that happens in the real world onto digital ledgers. And these can be any type of um, blockchains that are known to date. These can be future blockchain, even that aren't there yet, because they're agnostic to any type of blockchain. So how do decentralized Oracle networks work and how do we benefit from them? First off, as you may have heard, blockchain technology faces a lot of constraints, mostly when it comes to scalability. So we have the issue that there are not too many transactions that we can be doing per second. So for example, we have networking, storage or computation issues. So really what the DONs do, they're a center a layer of infrastructure that put themselves in between anything that can be datafied and any blockchain that exists. And a decentralized Oracle network is really a committee of oracles that solve on-chain computational limitations and heterogeneous off-chain data problems. What does that mean if you're a committee of Oracle? Think about if you rely on one simple data entry, so you only know the temperature in one place, how can you rely on that that is the accurate that is the accurate data point. So the problems that we solve with the decentralized Oracle networks are confidentiality, integrity, availability properties, and accountability. So that ensures that when I have a smart contract in the future, that that day when the smart contract needs to be executed, I know that I have the right data points available to do so. So that's the availability property. The accountability too is to ensure that I have a trace of what happens at what time point. And lastly, when it comes to confidentiality, how do we work and ensure that the privacy of data that comes in is being executed? What we really do here, we know that storing any data on the chain is very inefficient. It takes a lot of time, it costs money, it's, we run into problems. So the more we can handle off chain and allow the decentralized Oracle networks in the middle of the work, the more we can use different blockchains to solve problems and really get these hybrid smart contracts to work. And what does that look like from a more general framework? So really what decentralized Oracle networks help with is to get highly validate da validated data together with off-chain computation. And this is a very particular component where the Rome-based agencies can make a difference because as Eric was saying at the very beginning, this allows us to no longer focus on the problems that a particular blockchain may have. We need no longer be confined to an Ethereum blockchain or a Polkadot blockchain that has particular issues. Rather, we can look at what are general standards for smart contracts. How can we generally standardize the way that we want to measure child nutrition? How can we almost datafy SDGs that can have a clear framework of how these can be accomplished to then have decentralized Oracle networks that allow upon completion of any of these data points, a right set of smart contracts is executed, paid out in any kind of currency or goes back to a particular payment device that you would have that is simply connected. The first decentralized Oracle networks that are were established in the financial markets. 
they started to move on with insurance contracts. Arbel is one of them that we looked at before. And the next component where we will help to create inclusive um, decentralized Oracle networks is when we try to get real KPIs that we define that then enable the use case and the execution and the payment of certain services. And how the RBAs can help there and the Rome-based agencies can make a difference is what Gerard would tell you here in a second. Over to you, Gerard. Thank you, uh, Max. So we see a lot is possible, but what is needed to animate such a system? What are the necessary building blocks? What are the necessary conditions for sustainability? That's the key question. We need data. The current world is data driven. So we need to invest in creating the ecosystem to collect good quality data, data that is interoperable, systems that are interoperable. Investing in data governance frameworks is crucial to making this happen. Remember, collecting, storing, harnessing reliable data is quite expensive and time consuming. So finally, what could the UN agencies in Rome that work on food, agriculture and rural development do to facilitate this? First, we could all collaborate on standardizing agri-data. Data standardization is crucial to make these systems interoperable. Data that is needed to power the cases that we just heard from Max earlier. We need to strengthen frameworks and institutions to participate in these emerging technologies. Be part of the process to move it forward. Finally, the most important bit, building capacities at all level. Human capacity forms the core of adoption in improved ways of doing things, you know, bringing about the change behavior. So investing in basic building blocks is crucial to sustain these interventions and make these interventions go from an experimenting stage to a mainstreaming and business as usual stage. Next, we'd like to show you a list of FAO uh, knowledge products that we have developed. So these are some of the thought papers, case studies, and experiences that we have documented from FAO on using DLTs for agriculture. You'll be able to download them from the links provided uh, at, uh, in, in the slide. Um, thank you very much. And uh, we'll be happy to continue engaging with you to discuss with you to see how technology could help address developmental challenges. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Gerard. I would say over to you, Gerard. Uh, sorry, over to you, Eric. And let's take a couple of questions and answer from the audience here. Excellent. So um, welcome, everybody, again. Please um, take the mic and uh, ask a question, or we can have a question in the chat. We still have two minutes for questions, and then we go back to the plenary room. Feel free also to write your question in the chat. Uh, but feel, you can also take the mic and raise your question. I see we have about 55 seconds left. So there's not so much time. One quick question. Uh, how long did it take you to uh, develop the solution? Did you develop, develop it internally and how much did it cost? So these are two, maybe that's a, a short answer on these. This, these are um, solutions that are developed externally. So you see the case study references here at the bottom. It's one from Green World and one from Arbol. Both are um, supported by Chainlink. Um, the development has taken about two years in the Arbol case. Green World is still about to launch the proof of concept for more milder works, which is going to launch later this year. I'm not aware of the, uh, or familiar with the cost that it took to get this developed, but it's all been developed externally by Chainlink. So, so are they both in function currently at the FAO or they're in process of being introduced? The first one is in function, the Arbol one, the smart and here. I would like to welcome you all to a third session on blockchain applications to development finance. We'll be focusing today on enhancing transparency uh, for social inclusion and growth. I am very pleased to welcome my IFAT colleagues, uh, Dr. Brenda Gunde. She is uh, IFAT's Global ICT for the Technical Specialist. So Brenda, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gladys. And uh, welcome everyone to the masterclass. I will be giving an overview of why blockchain is important uh, to an organization like IFAT. Blockchain is more than cryptocurrency or bitcoins, as some of you would have known it. For IFAD, blockchain technologies introduces opportunities to enhance trust, 
automating our operation, creating transparency and improving accountability to our member states. Through IFAD's strategic framework, we aim to leverage frontier technology such as blockchain to mobilize and leverage sustainability and greater investment in rural areas through evidence-based innovation, thereby increasing our investments support into the rural sector. Blockchain will enhance our accountability and transparency into how our investments are being managed and their impact on small rural holder farmers. Blockchain technologies will support IFAD in its endeavors to mobilize more resources, thereby strengthening our work and also in terms of quality of our country projects and deliver development results in an efficient, cost-effective way that best responds to our partners' needs as well as accountability to our rural communities. Through our innovation and ICT for these strategies, we aim to be part of the pioneers of scalable and innovative use of digital technologies that support reducing poverty and food insecurity in rural areas. We understand that blockchain is not the ultimate answer, but we, it will accelerate our work towards ending poverty and meeting sustainable development goals. Through our collaboration with FAO and WFP, we aim to leverage blockchain technologies for traceability for agricultural production by seeking opportunities to leverage UN designated areas that will create opportunities for smallholder farmers to access new markets, access finance services through a transparent record of their agronomic practices. Blockchain based traceability management system is boosting access to credit, risk management and consumer awareness of knowledge of food safety thereby leading to more awareness on how food is produced and food safety. IFAD has been in the forefront of pioneering blockchain sol solutions that have a direct contribution towards ending poverty by ensuring that our investments are used e efficiently and we can be transparent in our financial reporting. One of those projects utilizing blockchain in IFAD is used to monitor funding movements and as well as enhancing our financial reporting efficiency. And this project is called TRACE. With that said, I want to give you back to Gladys, who introduced our next session. Over to you, Gladys. Thank you so much, Brenda. And I'm very pleased now to welcome one of IFAD's uh, winners of the IFAD Innovation Challenge. They will be talking about uh, Trace Blockchain by IFAD. We uh, will welcome now Maria Fernanda Miranda Munoz, Policy Analyst at the Financial Controllers Division at IFAD. In the chat with us, there is also Dr. Advit Nath. He is uh, IFAD's director of the Financial Controllers Division. And together with us today also are uh, Devon Yarbro, manager at uh, Ernst & Young, and uh, also Shagufta Sayani, also manager at, the, at uh, the Blockchain and Technical Consulting Division of Ernst & Young. Welcome everyone, thank you. Thank you very much, Gladys, and thank you everybody for being here. I'm gonna share my screen very quickly. Just let me know when you can see a full screen. Yes. Yes, we can now. Thank you. Okay, Martha. super. So I would like to introduce you to Trace Blockchain by IFA. This is a solution that enables us to uh, trace every dollar from the donors to the farmers. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve with Trace? If it disburses over 1 billion a year in support of smallholder farmers to introduce, expand, and improve food production systems in the developing member states. However, we have a big challenge and is to have full knowledge of all the funds uh, as they're being uh, disbursed. So currently we're using traditional means of tracing funds. This is a decentralized Oracle Enterprise Resource Plan and Financial System that is used in 100 locations worldwide and by 97% of our stakeholders. However, this traditional means of capturing the data means that we're missing key opportunities. And many times this represents a slow payments or so limited resource data to report to our donors. So I will show you how Trace works. So here in this slide, you can see all the actors in IFAD uh, blockchain uh, ecosystem. So you can see the donors, IFAD, the government represented by their ministries, the downstream suppliers, also the implementing partners and the farmers. And all of them are linked in the blockchain. This means that we can use this technology to connect all our system, but without the need to change them. Also by having all these actors integrated, now we have expanded the view to donors, to actors in the ecosystem that were unknown by us before, 
like the suppliers, also the group of farmers that are benefiting from their resources. So in my next slide, I will show the system that are we that we're linking in IFA. So by linking all these systems in the blockchain, we increase data transparency because now we have exact data where the funds are going to. Also, with Trace, we'll be able to have our anti-money laundry a system checking, performing compliant checks in near real time. There are other functions that we can use with Trace. And for example, Trace allowed us to catch any problems on the fund floats, and it will alert us to take from actions to solve those problems. Also, we can use the smart contracts, and this means that we will be able to have faster and cleaner transactions and also those will be captured either in the trace site or using a mobile app. Lastly, one of the features that I really like is that we have the possibility to track the development results of the project uh, by the different components, for example, SDG, gender, climate, or environmental impact. So um, I will show you the IFAT Kenya project. Uh, one second. Uh, to which we did the proof of concept. Uh, so we chose this project because it's very complex. It has different actors within it. You can see we have the EU trust, a trust fund, several agro dealers in it, and also over 180,000 farmers as beneficiaries. So with this project, we have proven that it's possible to identify and follow the flows of funds from the donors to the farmers throughout the life of the project. So I'll now pass the floor to Devon and Chagufta from EY, and they will show you uh, a, a quick demo on how Trace works. Over to you, Demo. Perfect, thank you. Um, I've started sharing my screen, and we're gonna walk through uh, what the solution actually looks like. So on the homepage, I'm able to add existing entities or add funding contracts or even users to the application. Um, and then I can also take a quick glance at some of my um, PDOs, so my project development objectives, and make sure that we're on track for the year. I can also compare some of these PDOs to my existing fund disbursements. So um, if we've dispersed all of the funds, but the PDOs are lagging, I can start to take some actions and get a better understanding of where we're, where we're currently at. And then finally, I can start to view any alerts in the system. So for example, if an invoice is um, currently unpaid or if some funds are moving and they seem a bit suspicious, then I can go in and take any, um, take any action on some of these alert items. Secondly, I'm going to move over to the flow of funds. So in the flow of funds, this page is actually built by the underlying blockchain transactions in the system. So in this example, IFAD is sending funds down to the government of Kenya. And then once government of Kenya has received the funds, they can then send funds down to e-voucher programs or um, then directly down to uh, farmer groups and shareholders. So down here on the far right, we have our agro dealers and we have some suppliers. Um, so this, this view really gives me a full understanding of where, where the funds are going. Um, and that way I can, I can go in and track these in near real time and take any action if needed. So in the interest of time, I'm going to pass it over to Shagufta, who will talk about our uh, invoicing process, and then we'll open it up for a Q&A. Thanks, Devin. Uh, so we heard from Maria how uh, we have the obligation of reporting to the donors and what we just saw in the Sankey is the flow of funds from the donor to the farmers. But the cycle does not really close until and unless we have the ability to see not just who received the funds, but also how the funds were spent. So, you know, uh, once we get to the final end state where the funds are actually going to the farmers or to the suppliers, we can start to track how these funds are being spent using invoicing. And uh, what you see on the screen right now is our low-touch mobile app, which we designed specifically for these farmer groups because we realized that not all of these participants will have access to sophisticated system. So that's the reason why we've built this low-touch mobile app. And what the farmers would do is the, the farmers or the farmer groups, they can go into our mobile application and start to submit invoices for things like concrete or tractor or bags of seeds. And once they submit these invoices, they begin to flow into the blockchain. 
and then these blockchain transactions get integrated with this view you know which we were just looking at um, showing just exactly how much has actually been spent and for what you know for example if it is uh, you know 1 million a particular farmer dealer received 1 million and out of which 20000 has been spent on let's say uh, buying concrete so we can track all of that in in this application uh, with that over to you gladys thank you so much agufta and all the colleagues uh, from ifat as well i would like to address the uh, i think that uh, our um, fcd director has already address the question by uh, by Abby. So let me address the next question to the to the panelists. What makes blockchain different from value chain from the value chain approach? Brenda, would you like to address this question? Sure. Sure. When you look at uh, value chain, uh, value chain is a uh, Brenda, can you turn on your video please? Sure. Thank can you. you hear, can... Yeah. So yeah, we can hear you. The, the, when you look at a value chain, a value chain is a, is a series of activities that do happen in a, in a business in a business model from um, way all the way up until you create a product, right? So from the input all the way to your product creation, that's the value chain. So there are series of activities that need to happen in that business model. However, when you look at blockchain, a blockchain is a distributed ledger of records. Um, so in the same way that we could take a physical record of, of, of activities or transactions that actually are distributed across a chain of those transactions, which creates a transparency. Each of those transactions is actually available and uh, transparent to all the members of that blockchain. So which is different is that two different business models and the processes and way it is being used is, is quite different. So block, blockchain is a series um, and it's distributed transaction ledger, while value chain is actually the series of activities that happen when you want to produce a product or services. I hope that answers the question. What you like? Thank you, Brenda. Thank you so much. We have 40 seconds left, so we won't be able to address the following questions. But if you could send uh, your questions to innovation at ifat dot org we will make sure that we we address the question and uh, we send it to you um with that i think we have only 30 seconds left and uh, we can go back to the plenary hall and i would like to ask my colleague brenda to please share the main takeaways from this uh this session with uh, everybody else at the at the event today thank everyone for coming um my name is kiriakos koparis i'm with the World Food Programs Innovation Accelerator, um, specifically focusing on frontier technologies, one of which is blockchain. Uh, in the next 10 minutes or less, I'm going to give you um, a bit of background on blockchain, just because this is a one-on-one -on -one masterclass, so just to make sure we're all on the same foundation. And then we'll cover some of the uh, use cases that are being currently explored at WFP. Um, as I go along, please feel free to type in your questions in the chat, and then I'll make sure to leave some time at the end to um, answer as many as we can. And then my colleague Fiona will be taking notes for the share out. So I will attempt the impossible and explain blockchain in three slides. Um, but just to make sure that we all have a common understanding of what we mean. Again, um, I realize this is a one-on-one -on -one class, so some of you may have less familiarity with the technology than others. But in a very uh, fundamental sense, blockchain is a technology that enables trust and efficiency in transactions. It could be financial or otherwise without the need for intermediaries or centralized control. So think about you know, sending money to someone else without needing a bank. So that's what we mean by decentralized and not needing intermediaries. Uh, blockchain is very exciting because it allows us to do um, a lot of things that were previously uh, impossible to do without a centralized authority. So we can automate processes through smart contracts. We can provide real-time tracking and auditability, which is really important for us as a humanitarian agency. We can send um, things of value. So it can be a currency or some of you may have heard of non-fungible tokens, NFTs. Again, moving value across um, the digital world without needing any intermediary. Uh, we can maintain tamper-proof records, and this is important when it comes to things like ID or educational records, vaccination records, uh, supply chain records, and many others. And, and more generally, we build trust without needing to rely on an authority. So you can transact with someone you've never met uh, and be assured that the transaction is valid and recorded appropriately. 
So blockchain offers uh, speed because we are um, eliminating intermediaries. It offers transparency because it is a decentralized network. Um, others can join and participate. It offers security because the data is immutable and it gives you a holistic view of what's happening across the, um, the data layer. Uh, a simple way to just rem remember it, essentially blockchain is, is a, another word for a database that is uh, shared and stored uh, in a decentralized manner. And it's the essentially the next iteration of the internet as it allows a transaction of value. So blockchain at WFP um, has a lot of potential use cases. I won't go into all of these. I just um, want to show here that the opportunities are many. And uh, we have just now in the last few years begun exploring how we can take advantage of this important technology. At the end of the day, blockchain is a tool. So for us, we, we don't care as much about the, the technology itself as much as what it can do and the impact it can have. So for us, it's important to know how can we serve our beneficiaries and how can we increase the impact that we have in the field using this uh, technology. Uh, the first project I want to mention is our longest running uh, blockchain project. It's called Building Blocks. It started off as a pilot with 100 people uh, four, four or five years ago in Pakistan. And over the last four years, it has grown to now reach over 1 million people in Syria, in Jordan, in Lebanon, as well as in Bangladesh. Um, and essentially, blo Building Blocks is a blockchain-based cash distribution system. So it's, um, can uh, folks please mute their mics? Um, if you're joining, please um, mute your mic so there's no interruption, thank you. Essentially, um, what this allows is a beneficiary-centered neutral humanitarian network um, that allows us, the World Food Program, but also other humanitarian agencies uh, such as UNICEF, Oxfam, and others, to provide humanitarian assistance directly to beneficiaries in a decentralized and transparent manner. So the recipients receive a blockchain-based e-wallet and uh, we send essentially a cash voucher towards this e-wallet and other humanitarian agencies can send their own uh, assistance. Now, the reason this is important is one, the beneficiary only needs one wallet to access assistance from multiple organizations. And B, because we are cutting out the middleman, we're also saving funds and increasing the transparency and efficiency of cash assistance in our programming. So as of today, we have uh, distributed over $271 million through building blocks. And, we, um, and through this, we have saved uh, several million dollars through uh, financial fees that we would have paid otherwise to financial service providers. The next uh, project I want to talk about is the Capitalist. This is looking at traceability in the food value chain, uh, specifically looking at safety and quality of food um, in the dairy value chain in Jordan. So the Capitalist is one of the startups that we have funded through our core accelerator program. And what they aim to do is essentially is increase the transparency um, within the dairy value chain uh, from producers in Jordan thereby allowing um, suppliers to procure um, dairy products that they deem to be of higher quality. And in return, farmers earn a higher living. So again, the importance here is not that it's a blockchain-based traceability system, but rather that farmers at the end of the day get to earn um, a higher income because of the products that they are producing and because they're able to um, participate in this traceability platform that allows them to assure suppliers that they are producing dairy products at the standards that suppliers are asking for. So this, um, again, is something that we started uh, last year in Jordan. And um, as you can see, if this works, we can scale this up to other value chains. So it's not specific just to the dairy supply chain, it can be scaled up to other food value chains in Jordan, as well as other countries in which the World Food Program operates. Um, the last project I wanna talk about is called Impact. So this is a platform, a mobile platform that allows 
um, our beneficiaries to engage in digital work um, as long as they have a, a smartphone and it doesn't a low end smartphone. This is it doesn't need to be um, anything um, that is intensive and a basic internet connection. So through an online training platform, our beneficiaries are able to um, learn how to conduct uh, digital micro work. So tagging images or um, cleaning data, depending on the task at hand. And in return, they receive um, payments in a stable coin, which is essentially a cryptocurrency that is pegged to a uh, fiat, so dollar, euro, or other main currencies. And I know some of these terms uh, may be new to you. Um, so um, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat. But what's important here is that through the use of crypto payments with our partner, Celo, we are able to provide beneficiaries who are otherwise unbanked the ability to receive payments and to um, have savings. So again, here, what is important for us is the financial inclusion aspect of, the, of, what, of what blockchain enables. And in particular, this is relevant in, in many refugee settings um, where, uh, or internally displaced persons that are unable to access uh, banking services for one reason or another. So this project is currently ongoing in Lebanon, Kenya, Turkey, and Colombia. And the crypto payment piece of it is now being piloted in Kenya with our partner, uh, Celo, who some of you may have heard of. Um, this is my last slide, and then I'll open it up for questions, given that we have four minutes le uh, left. Um, so some lessons learned from our work, and just in general from the blockchain space, is that most use cases actually don't need blockchain. There's been a lot of hype, and still is a lot of hype, around this technology. And in many cases, blockchain is not even necessary. Um, the second is blockchain is still a philosophical technology. What I mean by that is it proposes a new way to structure the world. So think about a world that doesn't have banks or central banks or other or, um, insurers, um, uh, identity issuers. Um, so that's essentially what this technology proposes. And that's a very different way to think of the world in which we live in. Um, the technology itself, while it is, you know, there is a certain level of complexity, what's even more challenging is the governance of a blockchain solution. So getting different stakeholders to agree to share data through a blockchain platform, um, having agreement on who gets access and who does not, having agreement on how data is shared and how the blockchain system itself evolves, those are the more challenging aspects of deploying a blockchain solution and less so the technology itself. And last, uh, for us at least, uh, a lot of blockchain innovation is policy related. So whether it's looking at digital IDs or looking at cryptocurrencies, these are a lot of policy questions that as a UN agency, we have to uh, unpack and really understand the implications of our operations and how we incorporate some of these applications into the work that we do. I realized that was a whirlwind, um, and unfortunately, it's really hard to do this topic justice in just 10 minutes, but hopefully you got a bit of an understanding of what the technology can do, and more importantly, the potential impact that it promises if deployed in an appropriate and beneficiary-centered manner. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and we have a couple minutes left for, um, for questions, so let me take a look at the chat. Um, all right, how can people use a stable coin or cash it out if they don't have a bank? That's an excellent question, Sergio. And that was one of the considerations that we had to take into account when partnering with Celo, which is essentially um, the way that you transact with cryptocurrencies is through exchanges. So there are many um, exchanges currently, uh, operating Coinbase being one of the more uh, famous ones, where you essentially can trade a cryptocurrency for dollars or euro or any other current or other cryptocurrencies. So the presence of these exchanges are really important in areas where cryptocurrencies are not accepted. And at the moment, cryptocurrencies are not widely available. So where we pilot with cryptocurrencies, we also make sure that we have access or there is an exchange that is operational in that country. All right, let me see what else we have here. 
Um, excellent presentation. Thank you, Tora. Do you need to use blockchain in your work on identity? Is it not unnecessarily expensive because it has environmental pressures? So um, I'll tackle the second one. There's been a lot of conversation and criticism about the environmental impacts of blockchain. And those are, those are very legit, especially uh, when, with regards to Bitcoin, which is the first uh, use case of blockchain technology and the most uh, popular one, the most famous one, and also the most valuable one in terms of the market share of Bitcoin. Um, having said that, newer technologies have um, emerged or blockchain technology has evolved and there are new experimental approaches that are a lot less environmentally uh, taxing. Now, those are still not widespread and I don't have uh, time to go into the details, but the, rea but the point that I'm trying to make is that while Bitcoin and some other, um, I guess I'll call them version 1.0 blockchains are very environmentally intensive. There are new uh, approaches to the technology that promise to be a lot less so, um, but that remains to be seen if indeed um, they can scale. Um, unfortunately, I'm noticing that we only have 18 seconds to go. Um, apologies, I didn't get to the third question in the chat. But I did want to thank you all for joining and um, I hopefully you're having a good session through the World Food Forum and I encourage you to join the FAO or the EFAD uh, session for the second round. of. Yes, rooms are closed and everybody's back. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, so with that, I would like to give the floor to uh, our colleagues at FAO so that they can share the main takeaways from their session, please. And you have three minutes to go now. Okay, I'll go very quickly. So uh, Max and Gerard discussed uh, the, a couple of use cases and smart contracts. So we were talking about all sorts of use, use cases in agriculture, for instance, weather, weather events and nudges and incentives for planet, planet positive agriculture to express those in smart contracts and so forth. Then Max um, started talking a lot about decentralized Oracle networks. And this is a way of overcoming certain blockchain constraints when it comes to scalability, to overcome limitations. And the more, so the more you can do outside of the blockchain, which is called off-chain through decentralized Oracle networks, the more you can simplify what is happening within the blockchain. And therefore it, it is a good way to overcome the, the limitations. Uh, in general, we spoke a little bit about the challenges. There uh, is definitely a need for my, more high quality data to avoid the garbage in and garbage out scenario. And we came also back to the principles like the FAIR principles, like findable, accessible and interpol uh, data. I think this is it from what I got from uh, Gerard and Max. Um, do you want to add something more, Max and Gerard? Otherwise, we go back to Gladys. I think you did an excellent job there, Eric. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Gerard, anything else that you would like to add? You have one minute left. Well, we were talking about what RBAs could do in terms of collaboration in, in promoting and moving this ahead. And we were talking about uh, working together on uh, key uh, data standardization, key data points that is needed for agricultural insurance and other aspects, just to add to Eric's points. Thank you so much, Gerard. Uh, I would like now to give the floor to our IFAT colleagues, uh, Brenda. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. Uh, in our session, we started by talking about how blockchain is, uh, is important for IFAT and how it is different from cryptocurrency and Bitcoins, as everybody or some of people may know it. We have also talked about how um, important, based on our innovation and ICT for this strategy, where IFAD and other uh, RIBAs, we aim to use scalable and innovative technologies, digital technologies that will support reducing poverty and food insecurity. Uh, we have also talked about opportunities where we, we see our work uh, collaborating with FAO and WFP, where we can actually look at blockchain for traceability um, in agriculture production, supporting farmers to have access to new markets and digital finance. We also had an exciting session on, um, on a demo on, on Trace, which is one of the where we have actually utilized blockchain to trace uh, funding investments all the way to smallholder farmers. 
which has increased our visibility as well as our, trans our, our transparency, not only just to donors, but also to the rural communities that we support. We see if, uh, IFAD working with other agencies to be pioneers of using digital technologies, not as a silver bullet or as a response answer to all the problems, but as a way to enable uh, rural transformation. Thank you. Um, my colleague, Maria Fernandez, can also add uh, some of the insights. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brenda. Mafe, if you would like to add anything from the IFAD room, you have one minute left. Thank you, Gladys. Um, I'm not sure, okay, here I am. Um, no, it was a very fruitful session. Um, we had the opportunity to have a demo on blockchain and how Trace is allowing us to trace all the funds from the donor through the farmers. And also uh, I explained and went through the presentation and we could see how can we link all the system we have in IFAD uh, without changing them to make sure everything is in the blockchain, giving us faster transactions, uh, also a transparency when reporting to the donors and uh, stakeholders. Over to you, Gladys. Thank you so much, Mafe. Uh, in the interest of time, I will just uh, go ahead and uh, give the floor to our colleagues at uh, the World Food Program so that they can share the takeaways from their session as well. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So the takeaway from our session is that, um, first of all, um, Kliakos shares three very successful WFP blockchain use cases. And then um, a few questions from the audiences are addressed uh, by him. And the questions are, uh, how can people use the stable coin or cash um, if they don't have a bank? And, the, um, and in our use cases, we make sure that um, there are um, coin exchange in the country that we operate in. And the second question was that um, uh, our audiences are asking whether we do need to use blockchain in our work in, uh, on identity. Um, if it's really necessary uh, due to the environmental pressure that created by the block, uh, blockchain technology. And our answer to that is that um, the new blockchain technology are more energy efficient uh, than the version one of the blockchain technology, such as Bitcoin. So we are hoping that uh, in the future with more technology breakthroughs, uh, our work in blockchain can be uh, massively uh, adopted with our environmental um, uh, aftermath. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fiona. Kiriakos or, uh, or um, the, the other members of the WFP team, anything else that you would like to add? Uh, nothing else to add, Gladys. Thank you. Back to you. May I ask uh, our audience, please, um, if you have any questions to put them in the chat box, and we do have some questions that are coming in. So maybe maybe uh, everybody can, can address this question very quickly. We, have, we still have three minutes to go. So um, the question is, what kind of technology are you using to develop this solution? And I guess this is uh, probably coming to the ones that did that, um, you know, that shared their case studies during the breakout rooms. So um, not sure who wants to start. Uh, Kriakos or Brenda, if you want to share what is the technology behind the solutions that you are working on. Uh, Brenda, you can go ahead. I'll go, I can go second. Or Shagufta, if okay. you want to address this. this I'll, ask, I'll ask Shagufta to, to respond. Yeah, um, Shagufta. For sure. Uh, so we are using a private Ethereum blockchain, which is hosted in an Azure subscription for this particular solution. And uh, it's a permissioned uh, blockchain. Thank you so much, Agufta. Um, any other questions from the audience? I, uh, let me check the other, the other chats as well. Um, we're actually running out of time, so if it's okay with everyone, I would just give the, the um, uh, floor back to Tui so that she can break us out again in the breakout rooms. They are identical to the previous ones, so make sure that you don't end up in the same breakout room that uh, you were just in. So Tui, back to you so that you can break us out. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the FAO's session.
on distributed ledger technologies for agriculture. Max and I are happy to be here and to share some of our experience in using distributed ledger technologies to help overcome some of the development challenges that we face. So as we, next slide please. So as we see, smallholder agriculture faces several problems, challenges that hinder the achievement of several SDGs. So how can emerging and established technologies help overcome some of these challenges? We find blockchain as one such technology that has the potential to do that. So in this context of this presentation, we'll take three case studies. First is agri-insurance. Can the use of technology, especially blockchains in this case, help improve adoption of agri-insurance? Can it help overcome some of the challenges in terms of uh, um, you know, verifying um, insurance claims and payouts through a combination of satellite imageries, use, use of drones, uh, mobile wallets, smart contracts, and uh, certified oracles? Can it help overcome some of the challenges that we face? The second is on rewarding good agriculture practices, climate smart technologies. How can we use technologies to be able to verify and incentivize smallholder producers to be more environmentally conscious, to produce uh, better, uh, keeping the environment in, in, in consideration? And finally, the one that is always spoken about on food traceability. How can technology, especially blockchains in this case, promote the uptake of um, um, you know, uh, strengthening market insure, market linkages for smallholder farmers, thereby strengthening their uh, livelihoods and having access to newer markets. So to go into some of these details, I'll hand it over to Max. Max, over to you. Thanks so much, Gerard. It's a big pleasure to be here and uh, I'm looking forward to your questions and your thoughts on, on what we do. Let me just get started with diving right into the smart contracts and how smart contracts really help address the agri insurance challenges. And there's the two biggest problems that we face um, to date in the agri-insurance phase, which is one, what type of data is the data available to capture certain events that trigger certain payouts? And the second one is the settlement process. As we know, for smallholder farmers and farmers overall, cash flow is the biggest constraint. So really ensuring that any type of adverse event gets captured and then to the payout as quickly as possible is what is needed. Smart contracts enable just that. They enable an automatic execution. At the end of the day, in a nutshell, a smart contract is a simple if-when statement. So if this happens, then something else happens. Usually here it is if a weather event happens, then a payout uh, takes place. And thanks to IoT technology and very, very accurate data, we are able to actually implement cases, and this is a use case from Arbol, um, that they can, if a day, during the application period or a day in a specific growth phase of a crop gets too much temperature, too low of a temperature, too much rain, too little of a rain, that's when there's an immediate out payout that is, that is taking place and is happening. And this is quite interesting because it allows us to tray us and gives us full transparency around the claims and the settlement procedures. However, let's move on and not just look at how we react vis-a-vis -vis adverse effects or adverse climate events, but also how do we incentivize, how do we ensure that there is a new agricultural standard, a new practice of agriculture, regenerative agriculture, climate smart agriculture that is being used. And that is what happens if we diversify the type of data that is necessary. So what we need to ensure there is we need to have something that takes the data from the offline world and puts it on the blockchain. And that is done through a digital twin or an oracle. Oftentimes these oracles mm -hmm. have have problems because with an oracle, you have one simple data point. So you start to have one measurement of data that is to be executing a specific contract. So that is where decentralized oracle networks come in because basically you take a network of small oracles and you apply the same distributedness as blockchains share on the way the data is put in. And as you can imagine, the use cases for this go far beyond financial or traceability. But imagine you could have triggers on child nutrition or vaccination rates, that every time a certain vaccination rate in a country is excelled and used, that's when certain payouts, micropayments can be triggered. Or just simple images of cooking stoves with a GPS and a date and time positioning. And that's what Greenworld does and it's gonna launch later this, later this year. 
biodiversity even. What happens if there's a certain health of pollinators, for example, that is accomplished in an area that we can use? The interesting aspect is, and that's the pathway to hybrid smart contracts, is we know we have many, many, many challenges on the blockchain side. We've heard it in the lessons learned also. We have problems with the tier one or even tier two. We have a thru throughput per second that is very, very, very small currently. The transactions per second that we can handle. But what if that no longer was an issue? What if the decentralized Oracle network can handle that? And we focus on the quality and you, you know, the data is ubiquitous, such that whatever blockchain that comes up and whatever technology leap forward is in the blockchain world, given that decentralized Oracle networks are agnostic to any type of blockchain, they can just be reused. So let's focus a little bit more on the decentralized Oracle network and say what it actually is. So it is a comedy of oracles, if you will. So it is a group of separate entities that take the data and make sure that smart contracts can be executed based on them. And by doing so, they solve the three big questions. It's the networking, the storage, and the computation. How many times have we not read the climate impact, for example? How many times have we not read how difficult it is to solve any computational issues on the blockchain? And this allows us to take all of that off chain to ensure that the, the heavy lifting, the storing can be done on a decentralized Oracle and then execute while keeping confidentiality, for example. The second big struggle that we have are availability properties. How do we ensure that if I write a smart contract that is to be executed upon a certain day, already will have the data that day that the payout can actually happen. And that requires an infrastructure that also decentralized Oracle networks can take place. So view it as an interface between and among on-chain and off-chain systems. And again, the more we can have off-chain, the less we need to put on-chain, lesser the impact on the environment, for example. Moving on to the next slide, this is just an idea of like just how many use cases that can be taken from this. We are right now, what is working well for the finance industry is now to slowly taking over in the agricultural space. So we're talking about the first smart contracts like Arbol that goes against deforestation. So if deforestation is maintained in an area, then the payouts come. What about the nutritional and educational standards? And this is particularly where the Rome-based agencies come in, because this is about if we build blockchain agnostic funds, we know that they will take place and that the financial industry will develop these. But how do we ensure that they are inclusive, that they're inclusive, that they are based upon our SDGs, the components that matter? And that is where Rome-based agencies can really make a difference. And I know that that is Gerard's specialty. So over to you, Gerard. Thanks, Max. So we see a lot is possible, but then what is needed to make these systems work? What is needed to animate these systems? We need to have data, good quality data. So we need to invest in creating the ecosystems to be able to collect good quality data, data that is interoperable, systems that are interoperable. So investing in data governance frameworks is crucial. Remember, collecting, storing, and harnessing reliable data is quite expensive and time consuming. So finally, what could the Rome-based agencies FAO, EFAD, and WFP do in terms of collaborating and facilitating this. We could collaborate on standardizing agri data, data that is needed to power the use cases that we just heard from Max earlier. We need to strengthen frameworks and institutions to participate in these emerging technologies. Be part of the process to move it uh, forward. And finally, and the most important, building capacities at all levels. Human capacity, human capital forms the core of uh, adoption in, 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 in imp building, bringing up improved ways of doing things, bringing about the change behavior. So investing in basic building blocks is crucial to make sure that these interventions are sustainable and they don't end up as just pilots, but then are ab also able to be mainstreamed and uh, become sustainable. So next we see a list of FAO knowledge products uh, some of them are thought papers, some of them are collection of case studies and experiences from FAO on the use of uh, distributed ledger technologies for agriculture. You'll be able to download them for free at the links that is uh, given there. So thank you. And uh, Max and I would be happy to continue this discussion forward with you. Thank you. And I would say over to you, Eric, uh, take the questions. Yes.
Um, yeah, please, uh, dear audience, uh, be invited to take the floor if you have any questions for Gerard or Max. There was a question from um, Mrs. Abir Abdelati Ahmed Momad. Thank you for that question. It was a good question. What, what I can add to that um, question is um, that indeed investment in data accuracy is, is good. What how Girard explained, like uh, setting in place data collection, storage and value extraction. Um, it, I would argue that um, in, the data accuracy would be improved if you use digital, digital tools because validation is so much easier. Because if you would do manual data collection, um, you may not have all the validation tools at hand to understand whether there's an error or not. I'm looking at my watch to see how we're doing with the time. I think we have another two minutes. Um, so please put your questions in the chat. And we are um, happy to answer. In the meantime, there was another question on the costs of um, blockchain i would uh, there's a kind of simplified model which you could do that um, if you consider blockchain as a storage mechanism which is in this case completely decentralized then the front end part of your uh, solution including mobile apps and so forth is more or less the same the thing is the back end part changes and if you would go to, for instance, a cloud service provider or blockchain, you can see the costs of a blockchain per hour. And I just checked one, there was one um, which I found, which is 70 cents per day. And that is your additional cost in uh, comparison to a normal IT solution, which is using a normal database. And that would help you kind of getting an idea of your additional cost for blockchain. I think we are. I'm just giving our colleagues one, a couple more seconds so they can join the IFAD session. Please uh, bear with us. Okay. With that, I would like to welcome you to the IFAD session on blockchain applications to development finance. We will be focusing on enhancing transparency, growth, and social inclusion. I would like to welcome my IFAD colleague, Brenda Gunde. She is uh, IFAD's Global ICT for Development Technical Specialist. Brenda, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gladys. Uh, welcome to the masterclass. Uh, my role is giving an overview of why blockchain is important to organizations like IFAD. Uh, blockchain is much more, much more than cryptocurrency. Uh, for IFAD, blockchain technologies introduces new opportunities where we can enhance trust, automating our operations, as well as creating transparency and improving our accountability to member states. Through IFAD strategic framework, we aim to leverage more frontier technologies such as blockchain to mobilize and leverage sustainably greater investment uh, in rural areas. We are working through an evidence-based innovation approach, thereby increasing the levels of investment supporting through the rural sector. Blockchain will enhance our accountability and transparency into how our investments are actually being managed and their impact on small rural smallholder farmers. Blockchain technologies will support organizations like IFAD uh, to endeavor and mobilize more resources, strengthening the quality of IFAD projects, as well as deliver more development results in a more efficient and cost-effective way, and respond to the partner and country needs. And increase our community. Through our innovation and ICT for these strategies, we aim to be part of the pioneers uh, for scalable and innovative ways of using digital technologies that support reducing poverty and food insecurity in rural areas. We do understand that blockchain is not the ultimate answer, but it does accelerate our work towards ending poverty and meeting sustainable development goals. We do have a collaboration with IFAD, as well as IFAD, FAO, and WFP, where we are aiming to leverage blockchain for traceability of agricultural production by seeking opportunities to leverage UN designated areas that will create opportunities for smallholder farmers to access new markets and finance through a transparent record of their agronomic practices. Blockchain based traceability management will boost access to credit, risk management, and consumer awareness or knowledge of how food is produced and therefore leading to food safety. IFAD has been in the forefront of pioneering blockchain 
that has a direct contribution towards ending rural poverty by ensuring that investment is used effectively and we can transparently use that in our financial reporting. One of those projects where we are utilizing blockchain to monitor funds movements and enhancing our financial reporting is actually called TRACE. So I invite Gladys to introduce our next session. Over to you, Gladys. Thank you so much, Brenda. I would like to um, welcome now Maria Fernanda Miranda Munoz. She is policy analyst at the Financial Controllers Division at IFAT. And in the chat with us today is also Dr. Advit Nath. He is IFAT's director of the Financial Controllers Division. Together with uh, MAFE, uh, we have also Devon and Shagufta, and both of them are managers of the blockchain and technology consulting practice at Ernst Young. Mafe and uh, team, please welcome. Thank you, Gladys. I will share my screen. Super. Let me know when you can see it fully. Just checking. Can you see my screen fully? Yes. Okay, very good. Okay, I would like to introduce you to Trace Blockchain by IFA. This is the solution that enables us to trace every dollar from the donors to the farmers. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve with Trace? IFA disburses over 1 billion a year in support of smallholder farmers to introduce, expand, and improve food production system in the developing member countries. Uh, the challenge it has been that we don't have full traceability of all those funds. Currently, we are using traditional means of tracing funds. This is a decentralized Oracle Enterprise Resource Planning Financial System, and it is used over 100 locations worldwide and by 97% of our stakeholders. However, this traditional, traditional means of capturing the data means that we're missing key opportunities. And sometimes, many times, we cannot have the slow pay, we have a slow payments and we don't have enough data to produce report to our donors. So I will show you uh, how Trace works. Okay, so in this slide, you can see that all the actors within the ecosystem, the donor, IFA, the governments represented by their ministries, the downstream suppliers and the implementing partners, as well as the farmers are all linked in the blockchain. This means that the technology allowed us to connect the existing system without changing them. Also, you can see that by having all the actors in create, integrated, now we have expanded the view to actors that were before unknown by us, like the suppliers, or exactly the group of farmers that are benefiting with uh, the resources. Let me change. Okay, so here we have all the systems that are integrated at IFAS, at IFAD. So having all those systems in the blockchain increase data transparency because now we have full visibility of where exactly do our funds go. With trades, we will be able to have also our anti-money laundry system performing compliance checks also in, in real time. There are other functionalities that we have in trades that I really like. For example, trades allowed us to catch any problems on the funds flows and also alert us to take promptly a action on some of those problems. Also, we can use the smart contracts, and this means that we can be able to have faster and cleaner transactions, and those are captured either by using the trade site or the mobile app. Uh, lastly, one feature is that uh, we can track the development results uh, by the different components of the projects. So for example, we can see the SDGs that we're targeting, or for example, if it's gender or the climate or environmental impact of our projects. In my next slide, I will show you the Kenya project to which we did the proof of concept. So we choose this project because it's very complex. It has many uh, players in it. For example, it has the EU, a trust fund, several agro dealers, and over 180,000 farmers as beneficiaries. So with this project, we were able to identify and follow the flow of funds from the farm, from the donor to the farmer and throughout the life of the project. So I will pass the floor to Devon and Chagufta from EY and they will show you a, how Trace is a work in action. Over to you, Devon. Perfect, thank you. <clears throat> so I started sharing my screen and we're gonna walk through uh, very quickly what, what the current application looks like. So. In this overview page, I'm able to add existing entities or um, additional users to the system. 
And I can also uh, start to get some understanding of what's going on behind the scenes in the blockchain. So I can start to see uh, how we're performing each year, um, how many funds have been dispersed. And we can also start to take a look at um, how we're doing compared to our PDO, so our project development objectives. Um, if we've, if we've um, hit 100% of our fund disbursement, but we're perhaps lagging in our PDOs, then that might be something that I want to dive into in more detail and take a look at. And then finally, we can um, we have a, an alerts panel on the on the right side. We can start to take any actions on um, suspicious fund fund movements or maybe like unpaid invoices, um, anything that's going on that I need to uh, pay attention to. That would be in my alerts uh, in this homepage. So the second section I'm going to go to is the actual flow of funds. So. Uh, what you're seeing here is a, a graph that's actually built by the underlying blockchain transaction logs. Um, and this is interesting because this means when it, whenever funds move from one blockchain account to the other, we track it in our ledger and then we're able to um, parse through that and view what's going on here. So um, we can see that IFAT has sent some funds down to Government of Kenya, for example, and then they have sent funds down to um, a couple of e-voucher programs, as well as um, a few other counties. And then finally, um, here on the far right, we can see that, that funds have finally gone to um, some agro dealers, some suppliers, and some farmer groups. So this gives us a pretty full understanding of um, what's going on behind the scenes, and uh, I can perform this in near real time, so I can start to take some action. Um, quickly if needed. So finally, I'm going to pass it over to Shagufta, who will talk about our invoicing and how we get these um, end stages in the blockchain populated. Thanks, Devin. Uh, so we heard from Maria on our obligations to report to our donors. But what and what we've seen on the Sankey diagram that Devin just shared is the flow of funds from the donors to the government to the farmer, uh, uh, farmer groups. But now this loop wouldn't be closed if we weren't really capturing how that fund, that money was spent. So, you know, once we get to the final end state where the funds are actually going to the farmers or to the suppliers, we can start to track how these funds are being spent using invoicing. And what you see on the screen right now is our invoicing module. It is, you know, we realized uh, that a lot of these small farmer groups wouldn't have access to sophisticated systems. So we've designed this low touch mobile app, which anybody can use on their phone. And, you know, the farmer or the farmer groups can go into our mobile app and start to submit invoices for things like concrete or tractor or bag of seeds. And once they submit these invoices, they begin to flow into the blockchain. And then these blockchain transactions get integrated with this, you know, the view that we were just share, uh, we were just sharing on the Sankey, to show just exactly how much has actually been spent and for what. Over to you, Gladys. Thank you so much, colleagues. Uh, I would like to take one of the questions that uh, we have in the in the chat. Um, it it says uh, that. Let me see if we have. Yeah, Emmanuel. We'll need more information on the specific question as there could be. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to get to the, all, the, all the different questions. John, could you help me here? I have different questions. Could you help me uh, get into the, to the first one that we got? Okay, let's, let's try this one. Brenda, we have a question and uh, they would like to have information on how blockchain can be used for nutrition programs in the field? Yes, so actually blockchain, I think as the advocate has also responded in the, in, the, in the chat, it could be very beneficial in the health sector. It can actually uh, uh, track compliance on, on access to nutrition services. At the same time also, because vaccination is part and parcel of vaccination of children is part and parcel of health and nutrition, you could actually use blockchain records to actually keep track of how children have been vaccinated uh, end to end. So because the record is immutable, you can actually have a trusted record and a transparent record of how many children have been, uh, have been um, uh, vaccinated. At the same time, blockchain has also been very beneficial in the supply chain uh, where you can actually track provision of services all the way from uh, the supplier all the way to, to the beneficiary. So there's so many use cases that we can actually give um, in terms of how blockchain can be beneficial to many sectors. Over to you, Gladys. 
Thank you so much, Brenda. We don't have much time left in the breakout room, so I would like to welcome everyone to join the plenary hall now and share your questions there with our colleagues. For any questions that you might have, please send a message to innovation at ifat.org and uh, we'll see you in the plenary hall. Thank you. Hello. Good to see you all. All right. So uh, I'm going to dive right in uh, because 15 minutes are going to go by really fast. Um, thank you all for joining. My name is Kiriakos. I'm from the Innovation Accelerator at the World Food Program. So I'm going to attempt the impossible and uh, quickly uh, explain some fundamentals. Um, because this is a 101 masterclass, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page on some of the basic concepts surrounding blockchain. So um, blockchain, whoops, uh, blockchain fundamentally um, is a, a potentially universal means of ensuring trust and efficiency in transactions um, or data sharing more broadly without the need of intermediaries or centralized control. So you can think of it as sending money to a friend without needing to go through a bank or um, having your ID be issued in a decentralized manner without needing to go to the government to issue your ID. Um, and this event, this fundamentally changes the way that we can do things that we have done previously through a centralized manner. Um, we can automate processes with confidence, especially using through the use of smart contracts. We can provide real-time tracking and auditability, which is um, what you probably have heard of in the trace um, pilot that IFAD has been talking about. Move value without the need of intermediary. So in the case of Bitcoin you, or other cryptocurrency, you can send uh, something of value without going through a bank or any other intermediary. You can maintain tamper-proof records. So um, data added to a blockchain is immutable and tamper-proof. And lastly, you can trust those records without referring to an authority. So it's a decentralized uh, trust system whereby you can work with others that you have never met and uh, move forward without, with trust. And why would anyone want to use blockchain? It provides speed uh, because we are um, eliminating uh, the middleman. Transparency as you allow data to be shared across a decentralized platform. Security, considering that the data is immutable or append only. And it also simplifies a lot of our transactions uh, by reducing operational costs and complexity. So see, these are some of the advantages that um, organizations think about when deciding to apply a blockchain technology to a specific use case. So blockchain at WFP has a lot of potential applications. And uh, while we haven't explored all of these that I'm showing currently, we are exploring many of them. And one point I want to make sure I convey at the outset is that for us and for anyone, blockchain is a tool. At the end of the day, it is about delivering impact and delivering value to our beneficiaries. The first blockchain project that has been kicked off at the World Food Program is called Building Blocks. This started in 2016 as a small pilot of 100 people in Pakistan, and it has now scaled to assist over 1 million people in Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and Bangladesh. Building Blocks is a blockchain-based cash distribution system, so it allows us to distribute cash vouchers to our beneficiaries via a blockchain-based e-wallet that they have access to. So it makes cash transfers faster, cheaper, and more secure, and more importantly, it allows different humanitarian organizations to provide assistance to beneficiaries in a transparent and efficient manner, which is really the true value add of using blockchain in this particular instance. To date, we have processed over $271 million using building blocks, and that has resulted in uh, savings of several million dollars because of the operational efficiency and the savings from not having to pay fees that we would normally pay to a financial service provider that we would normally have to go through otherwise. I should also mention, if you have any questions as I go through this presentation, please add them to the chat and I'll make sure to leave five minutes 
at the end to go through um, the questions that you have. Uh, Decapolis is a startup that we are supporting in Jordan. It provides a traceability platform for proving the safety and quality of food for food producers, farmers, and regulatory agencies. We are currently working in the dairy value chain, and we are thereby allowing or enabling, I should say, farmers to prove that their dairy products are of top quality, thereby allowing them to in earn an increase in income because many suppliers value higher quality products that meet certain criteria. So again, the importance here of blockchain is that it creates a transparency platform that enables farmers to earn more money. And that's the, the important value add for us is the ability for uh, livelihoods to be increased for the smallholder farmers that we work with. The last uh, example that I'm going to mention is a co uh, collaboration between one of our projects called Impact and a blockchain startup called Cello. Impact is a mobile platform that gives anyone in the world with a low-end smartphone the ability to safely earn money from home. So it's essentially a digital training and remote working platform whereby our beneficiaries can learn to tag data, to analyze data, or to do any other type of digital micro work and earn an income in return. In many cases where our beneficiaries do not have access to the financial system, we can enable payment through uh, the use of uh, a stable coin, which is essentially a cryptocurrency that is pegged to a fiat currency, such as the US dollar or the Euro. Um, the, the stable coin in question is uh, the Celo dollar, which is um, implemented by the blockchain collaborator Celo. And this allows many of the beneficiaries that are enrolled in Impact to access payments directly via the use of crypto payments. Um, Impact is already uh, operational in Iraq, Lebanon, Kenya, Colombia, and Turkey. And this particular collaboration with Celo is being piloted in Kenya at the moment. So before I open it up for the question round, I just wanted to share some lessons learned from our experience at the World Food Program. First and foremost, most use cases do not actually need a blockchain. We see um, there's been a lot of hype around this technology and we've seen a lot of companies and startups um, pitch blockchain as a potential solution to a problem that does not require it. So that's something that um, you should all be mindful of as you explore and, and, and look at use cases that are blockchain enabled to question whether or not blockchain is required in the first place. Um, blockchain is also, um, the technology itself is the least complex part of delivering a blockchain innovation. Um, governance is the hardest part. So as I mentioned, because it involves uh, sharing of data among different in, um, stakeholders, and it also involves the disintermediation of that sharing, how those different stakeholders come together and agree on how to enable blockchain transparency is quite the challenge. Also, how those different stakeholders agree on how the blockchain solution itself will evolve is also a particular challenge. The, the technology bit or the coding bit, so to speak, is actually quite straightforward. And for us at the UN, a lot of blockchain innovation is actually policy related. So for example, the rules for buying and holding cryptocurrency at the UN, as a UN agency are not um, readily uh, have not been readily explored and that will limit or enable our ability to really capture the value from these new technologies. So with that, I, as I said, I wanted to leave um, a, a few minutes to answer questions. And again, I know this was a lot to cover in 10 minutes, um, but hopefully um, you learned a few fundamentals about the technology itself and uh, also you've learned a bit more about uh, how the World Food Program is applying blockchain in order to deliver value, uh, both in our operations and to the beneficiaries in which we serve. So I will stop sharing right now, and then I will uh, quickly go through the chat and see if we have any questions. Um, a question from Anna Cristina, uh, who are the ones responsible to create governance for blockchain? So that's a great question. Um, essentially, if, 
in, in our case, for example, building blocks, it is a permissioned blockchain, meaning that um, the different uh, players or actors involved on the blockchain to validate the data have to be invited. So in that case, the those different entities, so in, for us, it would be WFP, we've also um, have worked with UNICEF and UN Women, they would all come together to agree on a governance structure. Uh, for some of the, the public uh, blockchains, um, the governance structure evolves over time and is usually um, determined by those that have the most um, value in, uh, invested in the particular blockchain in question. For Ethereum, there's the Ethereum Foundation that helps uh, drive um, some of the governance questions. Um, what is the impact of previous platforms where we use to do this type of transactions? For example, banks. So for banks, this is actually a potential disruptor because if you look at, for example, Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency, at the moment there are about 5,000 plus cryptocurrencies being traded. All of those currencies are being traded without any banks involved at all. So while the total of cryptocurrency value compared to the total value of money in the world is obviously um, uh, very, very small, you can envision one day in, in the distant future whereby citizens are transacting with each other only in cryptocurrency, thereby making banks obsolete. Now that's the stated vision of, of cryptocurrency, especially uh, Bitcoin, which was the first cryptocurrency application on blockchain, but we are very, very, very far from that happening. However, banks themselves are also currently exploring uh, blockchain because it it also helps um, disintermediate a lot of the transactions that they have to uh, be responsible for, especially when it comes to settlement and clearance. So uh, there are consortiums of banks that are exploring uh, blockchain uh, systems that would enable banks to share data more readily between each other. Any other questions from the audience? What are the objectives of the WFP Accelerator? Um, so the WFP Accelerator's main mission is to source, support, and scale innovations. Uh, those innovations can be derived from internal teams, so uh, the WFP staff that have a new idea that they would like to experiment with, or those innovations can be external startups that uh, we support and fund externally. So for example, in the three use cases that I just discussed, building blocks was actually an internal idea. Um, so it was a, a team of WFP staff that came up with an idea with that idea a few years ago that we helped to support. The Capitalist, on the other hand, is an external startup that we have funded and are collaborating with directly in Jordan. Whereas the third use case is actually a combination of both, whereby Impact is an internal team and Cello is an external startup that we have uh, partnered with to jointly deliver the pilot in uh, Kenya. Any other questions uh, from the audience? All right, well, we only have 15 seconds left. So uh, thank you all so much. I hope this was informative. If you have any questions or would like to connect, feel free to reach out. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the World Food Forum. Take care. Welcome back everyone to the plenary hall. And uh, I'm looking forward to listening to the main takeaways from the different breakout rooms. So without much further ado, let me give the floor to our colleagues at FAO, Max, Gerard and Eric, uh, please take the floor. Yes, I will uh, kick this off. The, I, I won't do a summary because we, we already ha heard that. There was a question in our um, session about the data accuracy. And Gerard answered that question by saying that the availability of good quality data is important for both digital and traditional tools. So investing in setting in place data collection and storage and value extraction is, is fundamental, is key for building smart services. And I would like to add to that that um, in the case of a 
using digital technologies in comparison with traditional costs, it's easier and uh, if you can do all sorts of validation, because if you do manual data collection, that might be more error prone than automating that. Then we had also a question from the previous session, which I would like to uh, round to Max on um, what, can you say something about the costs of blockchain? Yeah, I think, I mean, Eric, two, two points on that. I think, I mean, you mentioned a little bit during the session, it really depends. Blockchain technology is like a backend technology, right? So it's really to understand, you know, what is the development cost when I think about a front-end development, which is the simple app development that is needed um, for, for any development of the project. And then if you look at the back end, what is needed then depends really on what type of technology you're using, what type of back, back end, what type of blockchain you're using and where you want to start with it. So there it is more of a um, getting, the, the, getting the work done that is needed for any type of requirement has to be focused. And then really setting up the back end and blockchain is, yeah, should be 30 to 35 percent of the cost of the actual system. So I think the importance, and this is what we learn as we kind of go through the hive, is we need to focus on the type of infrastructure overall, and then blockchain is something that comes on top of it. And usually the development cost starting points are somewhere between 50 and $100,000 to get a back end up and running in a proof of concept way, in a, yeah, depending on where you develop it in the world, basically. Thank you so much, uh, Max. Uh, that's it from um, for now. Uh, back to you, Blanders. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, that was that was very good on the cost of the of the technology itself. We have um, a more in depth question actually from the audience that is looking into why blockchain. It's a, it's an expensive technology. So why are the U the United Nations agencies investing in this technology? Uh, could uh, Ifat please address that question? Sure, I, I can start, Gladys. Um, at, at the onset of most of these frontier technologies, the cost of these technologies is quite high until as when we create use cases and then these, pro, uh, these solutions do mature and they have been used, we are able to create uh, more public goods, we're able to create systems and processes which can be easily adapted. So at the, I think that's why also as UN organizations, we are actually investing in these technologies to add, to showcase uh, the importance of, of these technologies and also be part and parcel of the ecosystem to actually build much more lower cost solutions that would address more challenges of, of rural farmers. So we do agree the cost is high as an onset on any front end technologies, but we anticipate that we can create more products that support um, at, at lower cost. Over to you, Gladys. Thank you so much, Brenda. Um, since we have uh, some more time left for, for the IFA team, would uh, Mafe, Devon, and Shagufta would like to add uh, anything else to that? Or on any that other is, questions? Yes, I would like to add that uh, even though the price are high, I think that compared with the cost benefit that we get from using blockchain, it's a cheap solution in the sense that we gain transparency to the donors so we have near real time information uh, that we extract from the blockchain. Also, for example, that we have a tracker of the development of the project in near real time. So for me, and also considering the solution that we have developed, I consider that is something that we need to start thinking on in our agencies because the value that it really adds, uh, adds to our projects is goes way beyond the price that we are paying for it. Or to you, Gladys. Thank you so much, Mafe. I would also um, uh, would like to invite our audience today. Agustina and the FAO team will be sending a follow up email. So that email will also address some of the questions in the in the individual breakout rooms. Together with la with that, I would like to invite all the team here today. That, so that we can share literature, um, FAO, IFAD, and WFP have been sharing a lot of research on uh, cost-benefit analysis and also case studies demonstrating that blockchain technologies can actually reduce uh, transaction costs because uh, of the intermediary fees that uh, are associated when you don't have uh, blockchain solutions. So uh, I'm talking here about the value chain that was also one of the questions in the IFAD room. So with that, I would like to give the floor to our colleagues at WFP. Please turn on your videos when you're addressing the audience. Thank you. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, 
So we answered uh, again three questions from the audiences. Uh, two are focusing on one of our very successful blockchain project called uh, uh, Building Block. Basically, is a um, is a project where transfer we uh, use blockchain to transfer uh, cash assistance to our beneficiaries, and now we have uh, roughly around millions of users. Um, and uh, the audiences ask that uh, in the use case of building block, um, what kind of um, what kind of governments are there, and who are the ones responsible for uh, create this kind of gover governments? And then our question to that is that um, um, building block is a permission based blockchain. All our partnering agencies involved will need to be invited to govern the, the blockchain, uh, which really uh, increase the transparency of the transfer. So that's the first question. Second question is that, um, what is the impact on the previous platforms where uh, WFP used to do this Fiona, we um, we cannot. We will say uh, previous because it's not as advantageous. And the last question. Fiona, we have connection problems with you. Uh, Fiona, I would like to invite Kiriakos to to finish. Our analysts, um, our mentors, our skill in the soul worker, and over to you. Yeah, because I think that we lost most of the, the last message that Fiona was trying to convey to the audience. If you could uh, wrap up very quickly, we have one minute left before I have to give the floor back to uh, WFP for the closing remarks. Uh, yeah, so there was just um, mostly questions around uh, governance, um, which Fiona touched upon, which essentially um, has to be addressed uh, very early on with all stakeholders involved. Um, and in the case of, of building blocks, that involves a lot of the humanitarian actors that are participating in that network. Um, in the interest of time, I, let me pass it back to you, Gladys, um, so that we can wrap up and also have some time for the closing remarks. Back to you. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, let me just uh, see if um, Jean Marie is uh, ready, and uh, we can go directly to the to the closing remarks. Unless anyone from the agencies would like to to add something else, I think that Gerard made a very very interesting contribution in the chat. So uh, uh, please check the chat, everyone. And uh, Jean, Mar Jean Martin, actually uh, Jean Martin Bauer, a senior advisor on digital at, at the World. Food program. The floor is yours, Jan Martin, for the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. Uh, thank you, colleagues. So I'd like to congratulate each and every one of you for completing the Blockchain 101 Masterclass. You're now masters. Now, it's undeniable that blockchain apps have a lot to bring. They could actually radically transform our food systems. As Kiriakos was saying in the breakout, blockchain is a philosophical technology. It could be an instrument to bring unprecedented transparency and efficiency to our food systems and to our efforts to upgrade them. It could make uh, it easier for us to bring power to the people and bring us a step closer to zero hunger. Now, as you go back to your day jobs after this masterclass, remember that uh, you're there to solve an important problem, which is to end hunger. You're not there to preach the gospel of blockchain. Our enthusiasm about new shiny technology sometimes makes us forget that at the end of the day, tech is a means to an end. Blockchain, for all its amazing qualities, is not the solution to all of our problems. While we might wish they did, silver bullets do not exist. That's why I'd like to close this session by calling on each and every one of you to be clear-eyed about the uses and the limitations of blockchain. I'd like for you to be the ones who ask, what are we doing here? Do we really need a blockchain? Are we doing the right thing by the ones we serve? I want you to be the people who ask the uncomfortable questions that help ensure appropriate use of this new technology. I want you to be the ones that make blockchain apps a local, relevant, and trusted tool that serves food security programming 
the world's most vulnerable communities. There's a huge responsibility on your shoulders. If you're not able to square that circle, the revolutionary potential of the technology might be lost. With that, on behalf of FAO, EFAT, and WFP, thank you for your active participation in this session of the World Food Forum. So long. Thank you, John Martin. With that, we close today's session. And again, a reminder that our colleagues at the FAO will be sharing takeaways from today's uh, session with a follow-up email. And uh, to check the websites of uh, FAO, uh, IFAT, and the WFP Innovation Accelerator for more information, and the Atrium website, which collects many of the case studies that our United Nations agencies are working on. Thank you, and uh, we have three minutes left, uh, so I hope that you take advantage of those to be productive in the rest of the day. Thank you. Goodbye.